It's a very unfortunate thing about traders is what makes good traders, one of the characteristics of good traders, is that um, uh, they are usually very overconfident people. And uh, this overconfidence is, funnily enough, an advantage because if they're realistic about their competence, their ability, they wouldn't trade. And so you need, to, if you're looking for prop traders, you're looking for people who are characteristically overconfident. They're quite, you know, delusional about how good they are. Yeah, but you need a person like that. And uh, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this anymore, but this is why there aren't so many women in dealing rooms, in proprietary dealing rooms, because they're very rational people, <laughs> women, and they're not delusional. They aren't full of testosterone, <laughs> you know, and things like that. And you need people like that, sort of savages, uh, because those are characteristically people who do do well in, in trading. So women, unfortunately, are rational and, <laughs> and think things up and weigh things up evenly and say, this is, well, I've got no chance of making money in this, so I won't do it. Whereas the traders, yeah, and they're much more of that. <laughs> and uh, so they'll look for that uh, characteristic. Um, I, I've, uh, I've been involved in, a, in um, uh, looking for proprietary traders for an institution trying to select proprietary traders. The institution was an energy prop desk, a proprietary trading desk, trading in, in energy, um, and it was in Prague. And um, the problem with Prague is that um, uh, it's got quite a low um, cost of living and traders don't earn much in, in Prague. And uh, the boss guy was saying, Trevor, how do I get good traders? Because every time I get a good trader, he goes to London and quadruples his salary. So every time I find one, he just, he's off, he's gone. And um, so we were thinking about this, you know, because it was his business to operate this proprietary uh, house uh, there. And he got the capital, but he needed the traders. How do I get the traders? Now, you and I would say it'd be lovely to work in Prague, but, you know, these people are really just there for the money, not to look at the sites. Um, and um, so we were thinking about it and say, well, how do, we, how do people find prop traders? How do people like us find prop traders? So they're usually a friend of one of the other traders. They say, I've got a good guy that I know who I think would be a good trader, and they get invited to be. Or a Bloomberg person, you know, that comes through the office quite a lot, and you know, he's a very smart person, uh, that, you know, maybe we should hire him. Somebody from the mid-office coming through, you know, uh, we should promote them. But we realise the pool of people that we're, choose, that we're uh, looking at is relatively limited uh, pool. Now, if you think of these really extraordinarily talented traders, <coughs> st statistically, most likely, they're out there. They're in here. They're on the street. They may never become traders. You know, why? Because they have no contact with any of these sort of people. They may have nothing to do with it, but they would be fantastic traders if they were in that environment. So how do we find this? So what we did, we did it for three years, was <coughs> we advertised for traders and, um, in, the, in the newspaper in Prague, and, um, and the, the, the people did some tests, and then 10 uh, each year were selected <coughs> and they came to the company for a week. They were paid to come for the company. And they were told <coughs> that they would, um, um, the prize was they would get a job as a prop trader with a very good incentive deal. So one person uh, from this group will get a job in the company. So um, they came. On the first day, uh, they learnt about the markets because so many of the people knew nothing about the markets at all. And, um, uh, and they sat with a trader next to a trader on the desk. And if you buy here and uh, you sell here and you multiply the number of points by this number of euros, and that's how much, that, you know, told that, those, uh, those things about it. Then um, <coughs> on, on the second day, they um, uh, were uh, more exposed to this. Then on the third and fourth day, um, they were, were um, I looked after them, uh, sorry, the third day I looked after them and I taught them some technical analysis. Um, for most of these people, it was new to them. And um, uh, I taught them if, you, you know, if this line broke and you sold it, that it should uh, go down and what a good break looked like and a bad break looked like, what a head and shoulders was. I taught them a number of things. Now, this was actually a setup for what was going to happen next. 
Now, in the next two days, they, um, they were going to trade live in, uh, in five energy markets and, and with speeded up data of two weeks of trading, speeded up into, into um, two days. Uh, also with news coming out as well. So they were seeing the news coming and so it was actually speeded up trading, it taking uh, for two days. When they traded, uh, they had to make a note um, um, uh, before they could make an order, change an order, place a stop, anything like that. They had to say why they were doing what they were doing. So we had a record of what was going through their mind. Um, and so they then started uh, to trade. And um, Oh, and the other thing was we gave each of them a million euros to trade with. So even the ones that had traded before had never traded on in that size before. So it was a, and the idea is to make money with that million euros. <coughs> I filmed this, and you can look on YouTube actually. If the number, the name of the company is Chez. It's actually a, a government-owned company, funnily enough, a, a, a Czech-owned energy company, um, and uh, and they have a proprietary uh, desk which is very big to this day, and. Um, they, and uh, I filmed some of the people. Now, those people in those two days, I don't think one of them went to the toilet, not one of them ate or anything like that. It's just a picture of people fixed on the screen. Uh, their concentration was incredible. So it's pictures of people's eyes uh, on the screen. And they traded. Now, of, of the 10 or 12 people that um, we have, the, it was the last one that's there on YouTube if you want to watch it, um, uh, the... Probably half of them immediately gave up. You know, it was too difficult, the size was too large, they couldn't place orders, significant orders. They were doing 50 lots, you know, but you can't make any money with 50 lots. They had to trade in size um, and they just weren't capable of it. Um, uh, and then some of them didn't do it, you know, lost money and, uh, and uh, they lost all their money. And there, were, there, were, there was a guy who was actually a trader and uh, he was very unlucky because he was doing well and he turned um, his million into sort of like 1.3 million or something like that until the afternoon of the second day and he blew the whole lot. He, you know, so he put it all on red, if you like, and he, and he blew the lot. It's a big shame for him. But there were two, other, two of the group um, uh, who, who were real clear winners. Now, one of them, he put headphones on, didn't talk to anybody, and he was like a robot, a zombie, really, uh, trading. And click, click, did, wrote the notes and did all the trading. And he went pretty smoothly um, from one million to over three million in that time he did it. And um, it was not with too many bumps in the road, uh, too. So this was spectacular uh, uh, guy, this guy. No experience in trading, it was just, let's say, natural, let's say that. Then there was another guy, who was an Indian guy, that um, had uh, uh, went up uh, a bit and then lost a bit and then went up quite nicely at the end, but ended in the, I think, with 1.7 million. So not at all as good as the other guy, and a bit more up and down as he went, went along. But he was different. He wandered around, he talked to people, um, you know, he was a more chilled sort of guy, really. And um, so when I was leaving at the end of the week, uh, the boss guy uh, said, who, who do you think we should employ? And I said, well, there's a clear winner, um, but I actually preferred the Indian guy. I think the guy, that uh, he's a better trader in my uh, opinion. As it happens, they did employ that guy, <coughs> and um, he, um, and it was because the other guy they felt was very dangerous because he was a loner, and and uh, people like that will often they are the also characteristically the kind of people who will blow out. Uh, they will, they're too concentrated. Their um, overconfidence is extreme. Uh, they will hide losses. They will. You know, they have a high propensity to blow out. And whereas this guy being more um, social and that sort of thing would have, would have worked better with the team and, and would have, if he'd got into trouble, would have told people and things like that rather than hide it, which the other guy would be most likely to do because he had no friends uh, there. So, um, um, so they did employ that guy. And I can tell you that guy's still there now. And he's our chief dealer. And, and, he's, uh, and that was, he was found on the street now, this is just to tell you what's the difference between these sort of people and us. That's a hard, brutal uh, um, process to go through, but it, it was 
ordinary people, you know, we were looking for. And, you know, we're looking for those special things that people have. So what are these special things? They are things like overconfidence is, is, is a good thing, but overconfidence brings with it that danger of um, blowout as well. Overconfident people, uh, they characteristically... Um, I've known a few. I, I've got two friends here in front of me, old, old-timers like myself. <laughs> if I, forgive me saying that. But I think we can say that. Um, and, um, you know, been around for a bit. And um, I've known two really, really good traders. I've known a few more than that, but two in particular I remember very much. And um, um, uh, one was called Stainless... And the other was, was uh, what was he called? Anyway, it was a name like Stainless, but both of them because it was never their fault. So, <laughs> oh, Teflon. <laughs> so there was te- Teflon and Stainless. <laughs> and the reason was, you know, whenever they lost money, they'd say, why were you talking to me? Look what you made me do. I've lost money. Or the phone rang or the Bloomberg went down or anything except I lost money. You know, because they couldn't, their confidence was so high in themselves that it couldn't possibly be their fault. Now, those, those, the danger of those sort of people, of course, is that they can, they can blow out. And if you think of all the rogue traders that you know of, like uh, Nick Leeson, Kivel, um, and uh, who, uh, other ones that you've, uh, you, you know of, these famous ones that have brought, even brought down institutions, big ones, um, none of them were trying to steal money from the institution or anything like that. It was all to do with um, trying to hide a trade, you know, uh, Leeson, for example, you know, at the very beginning, you know, if he put his hands up and said, I've messed up, um, it's terrible, that's it. So what would have been the worst thing that would have happened to him? He'd have got sacked. That afternoon, he'd have been hired because he was a great trader and anybody would have had him. So, I mean, he, but instead, he hid it and he covered it and, and uh, eventually brought down Bearings Bank. And I believe it's the anniversary of that uh, this week, isn't it? <laughs> um, of the collapse of Bearings Bank. And, um, and so, the, you know, these are characteristics of those sort of people. They go hand in hand with successful traders. They're prone uh, to that kind of thing. They tend to be, um, uh, they tend to be not very sociable uh, kind of people. Um, they're uh, awkward, a little bit awkward with other people. Um, they you know, may be autistic or something like that, um, but successful uh, traders. I've known people like that. We, I worked with an office once as an American. He had his own office, you know, he was a big trader, and he had his own office. And he had on his desk, he was from Texas, a revolver. Okay? This was in London. Yeah, nobody thought anything about it. Uh, you know, <laughs> he, he had a revolver on his desk. And um, one day, we saw him on the top of his desk, shouting his head off, and he shot the gun and they had bullets in it <laughs> into the ceiling. I mean, we thought there were no bullets in the gun. <laughs> you know, they're a bit mad, some of these traders. But uh, typically, they are, the successful ones are not like that. They tend to be people that are quite um, calm and, uh, and trading has become to them a process. And I think this is something I can share with you and you can do yourself. The closer you get to this, the better trader you're going to be. Um, what you, what um, you want to do is to make trading itself a easy thing to do. So it's no stress on you. Now, how do you do that? You think ahead. Okay? And so that when you, when you decide on a trade, let's say you've got a trend line. Okay? There's a nice established trend line. Four points on it, gentle angle nice long trend line, whatever long is to you, all morning or a month or whatever long is to you. But there it is, a very defined, clear trend line. Now we're coming to tackle it for the fifth time. As a trader, speculative trader, a proprietary trader, you know one of two things is going to about to happen. It's either going to hold or break. If it holds, it'll probably bounce, make the fifth point, and with the trend, the demand is continuing to exert itself and will carry on higher, probably to a new high. Or it's going to break, and you know nothing. There's no law that it has to go on forever, and so it, uh, it's uh, highly possible it's going to break. But it's going to happen now, so you've got that on your side to know that there's a trade here to be made. So let's say that uh, it's uh, come to the line. It's uh, the little candles have got smaller as it approaches uh, the line. The bodies are small, so it's losing momentum, power there. Bollinger bands and and narrowing a bit. There's nothing, no oomph 
in the market, and then you have a nice white candle there at the, at the uptrend line. Now, to many of us there, it would be, an, you'd say the line is quite light to hold here. The nice thing about that is if it follows through, I'll buy it, and I've got a very obvious place to place a stop just below the low of that recent um, test of the line. So here's a nice trade. If it goes well, we, we, we could actually swing to a new high because it's a zigzagging pattern. Maybe there's another zig on the way. The risk reward on that um, could be five to one, eight to one, something like that. A really beautiful ratio for you. It's a good trade there. there. Now, so I'm, I'm going to say that if the market opens higher tomorrow on the next bar or in the next five minutes, whatever it is, I'm going to buy a place to stop immediately below there. But of course, I could get stopped into that and then it could flop down and break down, couldn't it? Now, if it broke down, um, actually, I think the move that would follow that would be bigger than the move up if it went up. So in an odd sort of way, I'd rather it broke down than it broke up. <laughs> So what I'm going to do is I'll play, if I had an order to buy one, if it followed through on this, from this white candle, and instead of uh, placing a stop below, I'll place an order to sell three. So one, I'll go long of, let's say I am long, now I'm getting stopped out of one, but I'm selling double short at that point. So if it is, does break the trend line and falls, I think it will fall f hard and fast from that point, I'll make back the little loss I've made very, very quickly. I've got double, uh, position, double sized position on it, and I think it's a better uh, trade. Then I just place the orders, or I, that is what I'm going to do. Stop thinking, and then just do it. Now that is the secret to a long life. Then it's a process. You just, this happens, I've stopped in, I get long, it goes up a little bit, then it flops down, breaks through the lower cell three, and I follow it uh, down. I know exactly what I'm doing. So it's like playing chess. You're always thinking ahead of things. And the more you can do that, the easier it will be. And um, so the less you're having to think when you can't really think, when the PL is going up and down, particularly if it's going down, your profit, your, uh, your blot is going, you know, your equity is going down, um, it's very hard to think uh, clearly uh, when, when that's happening. There's chemicals in your brain that will stop you thinking clearly will stop you um, doing things you're normally good at well. Okay, that's a, that is a, a fact of the functioning of the brain. If you want to see a YouTube video of me not being able to think clearly under stress, there is one there. <laughs> and it was, um, I, uh, I was attending, um, I was, it was suggested I attended a course on um, trading psychology. And um, I thought, I don't need that, you know. Um, I've been around for a while, you know. I know these, you know, it doesn't worry me anymore, taking losses and that kind of thing. And a friend of mine who'd suggested it said, no, you should do it. It's a really, really good course. And uh, you'll learn, even, even you will learn from it. And I thought, you know, what can I learn from that? I went to the course and I was wrong. Yeah, I did learn from it. But one of the things was the guy who was presenting the course, he... Um, He's, he said, I need a volunteer. He knew who I was, a reluctant participant. He said, I'd like you to uh, come and, and come up. Put me in a chair, put some, elect um, some uh, things on me, which was an electrocardiogram, and everybody could see my heart rate, my pulse rate, um, um, and my temperature as well. And, uh, and also two chemicals in my brain, which I can't remember what they're called, uh, these and one is a chemical which is secreted when you're uh, to help you think logically and clearly. Does anybody know the, the two chemicals I'm talking about? And then the other one is the flight and fear. Uh, what are they called? Dopamine. Dopamine is one, yes. Adrenaline. It's not adrenaline, it's cortisone. 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 It is, yeah. So, what it is is they, they work against each other. And so that um, if you're thinking clearly and the other, um, the fight, flight and f f uh, fight uh, chemical will suppress the clear thinking. This is why we lash out and things like that happens when, when we're under uh, stress. Now, he, he said to me, uh, while I'm talking, I would like to, you to answer some simple um, arithmetic uh, questions, mental arithmetic questions. There was a big room like this. I was sitting in front of these people. I didn't want to look stupid. And, you know, what's 49 divided by 7? And you could see on the screen, 
you know, everything going up a little bit, so I didn't quite want to get it wrong. None of them were particularly difficult, but I was trying to uh, concentrate and on making sure I didn't make any mistakes. He carried on talking. Then, then he suddenly said, unexpectedly, he said, I forgot to mention to you, Trevor, that I'm going to ask you to sing us all a song. Uh, <laughs> would you like to think about what song you're going to sing us? And you could see on the screen, a terror <laughs> come uh, as, a, as I was asked to do this. And it, I would still remember, and you can see it if you look on the YouTube, the question he asked me at that point was, what was 21 divided by 7? And uh, my answer was, 21 divided by 7, 3. It was like that. It took me that long to think of it. I couldn't think clearly because the... Uh, fight and flight chemical was suppressing the logical chemical. Now, when you think about this and how it relates to trading, this is how often people do things, stupid things, like pulling stops or doubling up or all those kind of crazy things or freezing with fear, pretending they haven't got the position, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, that happens because of this chemical reaction in your brain. And it's something you're normally good at. You know, normally you're very good at this. You play stops, you just do it and that, and then all of a sudden you change in character. And it's to do with this. And he, he then said, as the end of the story was that, uh, how do you control this? And he said, we borrow something from yoga for this. Um, we, uh, uh, what I'd like you to do, Trevor. Oh, he's, he said to me first, he said, uh, by the way, that was a joke. And, uh, but you could see on the screen that I was still in shock. <laughs> you know, everything hadn't gone back to normal. I was <laughs> like that about it. And he said, um, uh, um, uh, it was, so how do we get back into control? So he said, we'll do that uh, using yoga, uh, borrowing from yoga. We'll do it through breathing. And he said, I, I want you to breathe out for five, hold it for two, and then breathe in again. And that's a bit longer than normal, a bit uncomfortable would be for you. And I did that. And you could see on the screen, within about 15 yeah. seconds, everything was back to normal. So I could take control of my terror and and uh, control myself there. And I, to this day, of course, I get surprised and shocked and things happen. I know I mustn't do anything in that period until I've regained control of this really supercomputer, which has gone out of control, and um, I'm liable to do something that I normally can do pretty well wrongly at that time. So these are things which you learn, and uh, you know, uh, these are things which will make you, separate you, from other people, and here I am. I must say that you know I was do. Uh, I thought I knew everything, as even young and old people do, <laughs> you know. And there it was. I learned something. I learned a lot from that guy. Actually, I'd uh, I sort of read about that kind of stuff, but uh, I'd never really been shown it uh, before. It's when you see it that um, it really means something to you.